Chapter 1972, The Great Migration from the White Book by Machiavelli. Queens, Wintertime, 1971. Not everyone possessed that type of ambition, though. Rollo Smith's story was much too common where we were from. Rollo's night had gone much different from others in the Ritz. It was just after 3.30 a.m. when he stumbled out of the lounge and into winds that seemed much colder. He'd conversed with no old friends, made no allies, and met no beautiful women. In fact, his 33-year-old mind was so far gone, it couldn't conceive thoughts of fame and fortune. His bones snapped and popped as he pulled his ratty wool coat closed and wondered why he could never find one with buttons. Not good, because the way things were shaping up, he was looking forward to the coldest winter ever. He shook his head, thankful that the ground was dry. Could be raining, he thought, as eyes watched him in the distance. Mo, the Ritz's owner, was also leaving the lounge. He stepped out the door and head toward his Lincoln Continental. Shit, he shouted before going back inside. Rolo decided to give it one more try and cross the street. He pulled on the locked door and Mo came out seconds later with a brown paper bag. Rolo startled him and he let out a quick, shrill scream, higher than his already high-pitched speaking voice. Wah! Rollo! What the fuck? Man, you damn near got your ass shot fucking around out here. Mo was palming a little twenty-two. Rollo waved his hand nonchalantly. Shit, man. You just looking for a reason to shoot a motherfucker. Rollo had yet to get used to his relative's newfound wealth and paranoia. Seems like ever since you inherited that money, you've been acting brand new. Come on, man. Do your cousin a solid and let me crash on that cot in the back. It's colder than a son of a bitch out here. Kind of like you. He couldn't resist. He knew the answer to the question before he asked it. No, answered Mo flatly, smirking and looking Rollo up and down. What the fuck am I? The Red Cross? Does this bag look like a fucking charity bell to you? I run a lounge, not a flop house. Oh man, what the fuck do that got to do with anything? I'm your blood. Help your people out. People? Mo looked around. What people? He asked. Am I a fucking preacher? Where's my congregation? Look man, I don't owe you shit. I let you drink for free and I ain't even fucking you. Oh yes you are, said Rollo disgustingly. Man, you gave me two funky-ass beers and one shot of whiskey. I'm a motherfucking dope addict son. It's going to take more than that. Mo said nothing. There was no arguing good logic. He reached into the bag and pulled out six or seven hundred dollars. He peeled off the singles, 17 in all, and put the rest back in the bag. Here. Trip is busy in there now. Come back later and you can mop up. Rolo snatched the dollars from him with one hand and punched him in the jaw with the other. Mo staggered from the blow. You a bitch, Rolo screamed. You gon' need me one day, and that shitty little gun ain't gon' help you. Rolo ran away at full speed, not wanting that shitty little gun to make him a liar. Mo rubbed his jaw, almost amused, as he watched his cousin sprint toward the subway. Ladies and gentlemen, the nut has left the building. He walked off, fingering his keys and thinking, I wonder if that bitch... He never finished his thought. A gloved hand covered Moe's mouth from behind, and a gun was forced into his back as a voice demanded, Be quiet, and give me everything you got. Okay, take it easy. Just be cool, baby. Those were Moe's last words. The gunman, for whatever reasons, squeezed two in his back, grabbed the keys and bag, and then sped off in his car. In the distance, Rollo thought, I wonder if that bitch is shooting at me. After nearly an hour, Rollo walked down Fulton Street in the changing area of bed -Stuy. By the 1970s, generations of prominent families had cut their huge 20-room brownstones into smaller units and were renting to the poorer ones that were moving to Brooklyn. 
The once noble gentry that lived there kept to tradition and gentrified other areas. Now this borough had a methadone clinic and a liquor store on one corner and working class family units on the next. The clinics didn't open until 5.30 a.m., but the one thing a fiend will be on time for is a fix. So every morning, as the batteries of the city, bus drivers, hospital and postal workers and janitor types awoke before day to begin their shifts, zombies too crawled out from under their rocks, as the mayor put it, scratching, coughing, and looking for a little pick-me-up to get them started. It was 4.45 on the corner of Fulton and St. James Place when Rolo slapped his hands together and blew into them. He sat on the stoop wondering what blessing God would grant him today. Yesterday, he'd hustled up his own. Donald and Rolo Smith weren't related. They'd only known each other for the few months that Rolo had been at the clinic, but already they'd sized the other up. It rained overnight and was a dreary morning. The patients were glad to be inside, even though the entire clinic smelled like a wet, half-smoked cigarette. Donald hadn't slept much. At home, his mother-in-law had been on his case all night, nagging about everything. Bitch, if you know so much, why you staying with your daughter for, huh? Donald had let the truth slip out, and before knew it, both women were on his ass talking all kinds of shit. They took turns during the night. One slept while the other one talked. He'd already done a year inside and was in the last months of a parole sentence for a botched armed robbery. He had to be on the grill at 7 a.m. and the two wouldn't stop bitching. That morning, he saw Rollo in the corner in the clinic talking. They nodded at each other while listening to the sleepy voice of a nurse who'd been up all night bitching at her man. She was calling out names and was still in the ease when Donald dozed off. Taylor! Taylor! Right here, baby, Taylor shouted, rushing to the cart and waking Donald. Taylor, he thought. Hey, sweetheart. Ah, I was over there talking to my man. And you ain't called my name. I'm Smith, the nurse snapped. I called Smith. I'm on the T's now. Donald stepped back. All right, baby, but I didn't get mine, so... What Smith is you? Uh, D. Donald Smith, he said groggily. The nurse looked at him. What you trying to pull? You checked right here. Look. Sure enough, there was an X in the box next to his name, right under Rollo Smith. What kind of shit is this? wondered Donald out loud. Listen, baby, I was talking to my man over there, said Donald, pointing to no one. I ain't been up here. Taylor swallowed his medicine and walked slowly to the door. When I looked out there, you was asleep, said the nurse, twisting her lips. However it go and come, it ain't no extras. She pointed to a sign on the wall. I don't want no extra, Donald said, his voice rising with his fear of going the whole day without his medicine. I ain't been up here. That's what I'm trying to tell you now. Don't be yelling at me. You won't get nothing tomorrow or the next day, she mumbled. Mess with me, stankin' bitch, Donald mumbled back. Dope fiend bitch, your mammy is a stankin' bitch for having you. Outside, Donald saw Taylor look at Rollo and shake his head. A square and a smile were on Rollo's lips while he spoke. Playboy, them bitches giving you a hard time in there, man? Donald thought he looked a little higher than he should have. Man, fuck these hoes, he said, sprinting for the bus and spending the rest of the day in pain standing over a hot-ass grill. That evening, Donald's mother-in-law was still bitching. He needed a drink and wound up spending his last two dollars at a hole in the wall where all the down-on-their-luck dudes hung out drinking cheap liquor. Man, I wish I had some more money. That solved all my problems, he told the bartender. Look here, I hate to tell you, said the bartender lying. He loved to keep up shit. Your man Rollo was just in here trying to score. That's who suckered you this morning. I heard him telling the story to Barry. <laughs> That's your man, though. 
Donald was mad as fuck and knew the lounge up in Queens where Rolo hung out. He went to the crib, got his pistol, and waited till past three in the morning for him to leave. The plan was to teach him a lesson. It's about damn time, he said, when he saw Rolo leaving the bar. But seconds later, the sparkling knot Mo pulled out of the bag altered his plan. Shit, he thought. My wish done come true. New York City, Brooklyn, 71. It was 5 a.m. when Rolo saw the Lincoln pulling up. He knew he'd pay for punching his cousin one day, but he didn't think it'd be this soon. The door opened and Donald ran up on Rolo, peace in hand. He hadn't seen the police car on the lookout for a stolen Lincoln Continental tailing him for the last five blocks. In a flash, Rolo saw it all, his whole life. His cigarette fell to the ground as 5 pumped Donald full of rounds. Donald had bought a bag of time bomb and gotten so high he couldn't believe his own eyes. He thought Rolo was shooting at him. For the second time that night, he unloaded, blessing Rolo with an end to his pitiful existence and proving that the Lord works in mysterious ways. $400 found its way into a policeman's pocket and what was left of the bag was entered into police custody. All that glitters. Around the corner, Gaeta Nice was startled. She'd been dreaming and thought she'd heard fire clappers, the kind that they'd pop year-round on the island of Jamaica. Her boyfriend Paul's snoring reminded her of her whereabouts. She opened her eyes and looked at the clock. It was 5.02 a.m., only an hour before her day began. She'd been sick most mornings for the last week and needed her rest. Outside, there were sirens approaching. Her eyes circled her spacious apartment before she shut them and went back to sleep. She felt grateful to be there. This island had another kind of clappers. But she'd learned to keep on pushing on because in America, the sky was the limit and one way or another, she'd soon have what she wanted. Jamaica, Kingston, 1968. The time had come for Gaeta Nice to make a choice. England or the States? As for England, since they'd invaded and colonized her homeland in 1655, she was already a citizen. She'd visited an uncle who lived there a couple of times before. It's a filthy mess, London, them folks there. Mighty rude, she told Paul when they discussed the two. He, however, had seen things differently when he left for England over ten years before Gaeta would make her exodus. England, London, 1956. Paul was 22 years old and ready for a change of pace. He had a dream and was determined to follow it. He wasn't a sound boy singing songs of freedom and fighting for the honor of his people, nor did preaching and singing in the church with his father appeal to him. He smoked, but the idea of sitting in the heat, sweating, and getting wasted on one of the spice plantations wasn't appealing either. Paul was fascinated by the telly and was determined to get on it somehow. He truly believed that if he worked hard enough and do the right thing, he would one day see his face on the BBC. Paul hopped on a plane and immigrated to England, becoming one of the quarter million Jamaicans that heard London calling between 1950 and 1960. On arrival, he found that the area where he was to live was not the pristine and regal England that he'd heard about, but an old and dirty city with piss and vomit in every corner where grim-looking foreigners called him names and tried to break his spirit. Yet everywhere he went, he heard the sounds of marching, charging feet. This country was going through a change. The time was right for revolution. Paul refused to turn back. He was determined to blend in and change with it. His plan was to one day be a star. He took jobs at hotels and restaurants. He worked all the shifts, when and wherever he'd be more inclined to meet the beautiful people. No matter what, you wouldn't catch him leaving on the midnight train back to Zion. Paul applied every few months to the BBC offices and by 1960 had finally been hired as a janitor. He gave his resume and portfolio to anyone who'd see them, but after four years, he was no closer to making it than the day he arrived. He never showed it, but inside, he was struggling. When Lafayette Ron Hubbard moved to England, and headquartered his Church of Scientology there, 
it garnered so much attention, Paul began to question his faith. He took his father's advice and got on some praise the Lord shit. If I should die before I wake, our father, Jamaica, Kingston, 1968. The Caribbean islands are lush and fertile. This one covers over 4,200 miles of beautiful land, thick with fruit trees and greenery. It was much different than where we were from. But you know what they say about the color of the grass on the other side. Prime Minister Michael Manley brought independence to Jamaica in 1962. Finally, Jamaicans were to have their own country. Some took advantage of their freedom and began traveling to the neighboring isles. Those who landed in Cuba got a surprise when their passports were seized. It seemed that the queen wanted to once again rid her territories of troublemakers. She banned American civil rights activists and political organizations from entering the island, and Jamaicans began to realize that many times, freedom is just an illusion. Selassie's jaw, ride the King's Highway, return to Zion. In Kingston, every wall was lined with graffiti. It was one way to make your voice heard. The voting majority supported the Jamaican Labor Party. They shouted their names from the rooftops and painted JLP everywhere. The party won by a landslide, and in West Kingston, where Gaeta lived, a state of emergency was declared. Gaeta loved her home and family, but at 18, she knew there was little future for her there. Already, all her time was divided between school and sewing for small clothing company owned by Masao, a longtime family friend. When her father was killed in a fishing accident, Masao promised, As long as me company run, me door is open to you. Her mother had been working for the company since she was 14 and started teaching Gaeta at seven. By now, she'd developed a keen eye for fashion and was one of their best seamstresses. Whenever she could, she'd relax with a glass of Booth's rum, her sensational Mai Tals records, she loved ska music, and her favorite Vogue and Cosmopolitan magazines. Downtown, she'd see the women strutting in last season's fashions. They might be fooling their co-workers, but nothing got past her. She could always tell the real from the fake, and she'd let you know it. It was that talent more than anything that would help to shape her decision, and one she'd try to pass down. The television news broadcast the deportation of Dr. Walter Rodney back to his homeland. He was a university lecturer of, of Guyanese descent and a movement advocate whose influence had become a problem. It was a hot topic during the days of the 68 Fashion Expo, as Gaeta and her mother browsed through the rows of garments looking for styles to copy, she noticed the main, one of the few black fashion models of her day, chatting with some industry people. He pulled her mother closer to the crowd, hoping to have meet her. It serves him right. I've recently returned from America and London. The atmosphere there is too fragile there to have an instigator like him stirring up trouble here. He is obviously educated enough to be speaking at the university level. He should have kept quiet and enjoyed Jamaica. That's what I plan to do. The words were from Samantha, a young, rail-thin model with freckles and fiery red hair. Gaeta watched as the others stood around, giving similar opinions of a man who she'd come to respect. Emaine said nothing. Gaeta let go of her mother's hand and approached the crowd. She wasn't loud or brash, and Mama Niece couldn't make out her words. But by the looks on the faces in the crowd, her opinion wasn't the popular one. She looked good standing there in the crowd, natural, thought Mama Niece, hoping that her daughter hadn't caused the scene. Later, as they browsed, Emaine sought them out to congratulate Gaeta on the things she felt she couldn't say. Full of smiles, they exchanged information, and two weeks later, Mama brought home a letter from the post office. Gaeta's decision had finally been made. Four days later, Dressed in her finest, she said her goodbyes and boarded a plane. New York City, LaGuardia Airport, 1968. Her flight landed at 9 p.m., but Gaeta was too busy stargazing to hear the pilot's instructions. The view was far out. Surrounded by thousands of twinkling lights, she imagined herself aboard the Apollo, making her very own giant leap. On the ground, the airport was jumping as the PA sounded with flight informations and people from different countries hurried to catch a flight to somewhere. For nearly an hour, she explored the airport, part of her afraid to step out into the great unknown, another part getting a feel for her new home, until 
May I help you, ma'am? Gaeta smiled pleasantly at the officer blocking her path. No, thank you, sir. Me just looking around. You've been wandering around here for hours. Don't you have some place to go? What you mean, hours? Me plane just landed, not long ago. Here is the ticket. See? She held out all her documents, and the officer looked them over carefully. Jamaica, he said. Well, you aren't in Jamaica anymore, lady. We got laws here against vagrants and loiterers. Beat it before I arrest you. He pressed the papers flat into her stomach, just under her breasts. Her hands covered his as she grabbed for them. The officer took the liberty of giving her breasts a squeeze before removing his hand and walking off. Gaeta was young and attractive and dressed in a two-piece Anne Klein knockoff that she'd made. She knew she looked good, far from a vagrant. She gathered her things and hailed the cab. Inside the chairman of the board sang, That's life. That's life. That's life. That's what all the people say. Who is this on the radio? snapped Gaeta. Like most people, she'd heard the music, but never paid attention to the lyrics. That is Frank Sinatra, ma'am. You like it? asked the cabbie, watching her through his mirror. Who, you say? Sinatra? That old white man, she asked. She was frowning a little and hadn't noticed the driver at all, but the words to the song would remain forever in her memory. Tonight, old blue eyes made a new fan. Yeah, man. They sells him on the second floor at the time store. I know you've been there, he said, watching as her frown turned upside down. He grinned. Is that a smile me put on your face, child? What is your name? demanded Gaeta. They call me Paul, he answered, now watching the road. Where are you from? How you know about the time store? You aren't serious. That's your papa. On and on she went, long after they had reached her destination, a hotel in Brooklyn recommended by Maine. She and Paul parted, feeling like old friends, exchanging numbers and promising to keep in touch. It was the start of a long courtship, and pretty soon you couldn't separate them. Paul told her all about the years he spent in London and the stars that he'd met. She told him about the JLP and gave him up-close information on JLP and the movement. He told her about all the rock stars he'd seen play in dive bars and the sex, drugs, and strange behavior that were finding their way across the pond. She told him about how a chance meeting with Emane had led to a job in the garment district. Paul even opened up to her about his attempts at being a movie star and how he didn't get far. Gaeta was realistic in her encouragement, letting him know that dreams don't always come true. But as she'd learned, you have to get back in the race. That night, she lay in her hotel room thinking about the incident with the policeman. He could not resist me. Him just won a cup of feel. Brooklyn, 1971. It was 6.32 a.m. Paul lay awake in bed while Gaeta stood retching in the bathroom sink. Gaia girl, what's the matter with you? You got something you want to tell me? Paul, my love, maybe we better sit and talk. Paul was excited when he heard the news. At 37 and some change, he was glad to hear that his seamen were still swimming. A child would carry on his family name and was perhaps the one thing that could help reunite him with his own father. When he'd left London, his father tried desperately to get him to return to Jamaica, where together they'd run the church. Again, he declined his father's offer. It was the beginning of fierce argument that would leave the two silent all these years. Gaeta's love for Paul was true, but not strong. She thought about him and the way they met. She was so young, he had to correct her when she mistook all the skyscrapers in New York for cathedrals. Where she was from... The largest buildings were always churches. Paul had been a friendly face, one that reminded her of home, and at 14 years her senior, sometimes the father she'd been missing. She wondered was that what she'd seen in him all along, or was it the reason she kept her answer to his marriage proposal on hold, and the fact that lately he'd been hinting at returning to Jamaica. Not happening, Papa. The garment district work was good, but more promising was her nursing classes at Queens College. By mid-March of 1972, Gaeta had just come from visiting her mother. She was quiet as Paul drove them home. She had some bad news to deliver. 
Sit down, darling. I have something to tell you, she said, unpacking the bottles. One was her favorite Jamaican rum, and the other, a more precious bottle of Jamaican whiskey. Paul's heart sank when he saw it. His voice was barely audible. Gaia, what's going on? Darling, I saw your father while I was at home. He's not doing well. Your mother gave me this to bring to you. She wrote you a letter too. Tears welled up in Paul's eyes as he read it. Gaeta kissed him and opened the whiskey. Paul knew the bottle well. His papa had it since he was 12 when he made his first batch of homegrown. She mixed the two and they took turns taking sips. In April, he made the trip back home to be by his father's side. A month and a half later, Gaeta lay watching a special on the Olympics in Munich. Mom's was a month overdue and the baby was ready for the lights of New York. But was New York ready for the likes of him? He was close to shooting his way out when it happened. Around 2.15 p.m., Gaeta's water broke. Mercy, mercy, she cried. Paul was still away, but they'd planned for this. She found the keys to the cab and drove herself to Cumberland Hospital. Just stay calm, Gaia. You can do it. Hours later, she held her son, Thomas. Emain was in town doing shoots and came to be with her friend. Gaeta wished Paul was there. Nevertheless, she was overjoyed thinking about something his father had said when he'd given her his blessings. Come closer, me darling. Let me take a good look at you. You look good, healthy. He sat on the porch rocking in his chair and smiling. How is that baby doing? Fine, Papa, just fine, she answered. It's me I'm worried about. It is all the time kicking, punching, and keeping up a fuss. I think he's gonna be a bad boy. Papa laughed heartily. Right you are, me darling. The child will be a boy. But don't you worry about a thing, girl. Jaws watching that one. He will be a special child. The conquering lion. In the city, they will call him King of Kings. That concludes chapter 1972 of The White Book by Machiavelli. Subscribe to this channel, like and share. See you in the next one.